This is part two of my seed germinating workshop. If you haven't watched part one, I would start there. That gives you all the background information for starting seeds and understanding what dormancy is. In this video, we're going to look at the more practical aspect of how do I get over dormancy and how do I get those little things that actually make a root. So tonight we're going to look at tricks for overcoming dormancy. A lot of people call these pre-treatments, but essentially we have to figure out how do we get the seed to actually germinate. Last week we looked at ways to figure out what these dormancies are and what the treatments might be. We looked at the Ontario Rock Garden and Hardy Plant Society website and we looked at some examples. So that's where I go. I look at that and say, okay, now I know what I need to do with these seeds. But tonight I actually want to look at the mechanics of how we actually do some of those things. First one is scarification or nicking the seed coat. So some seeds have quite thin coats and we don't have to worry about it but other seed have quite thick coats and it helps a lot to nick them remember one of the things that has to happen with all seeds to overcome dormancy is to absorb water the water initiates the biology inside the seed it gets it to swell it starts the biochemistry going it initiates all those chemical reactions that actually make the root start to grow if we have a seed that has a very thick coat then even just putting that in water doesn't get the seed to absorb water so we help that along a little bit with scarification there are really two methods to do that you sandpaper uh, what i find works really well is this triangular file uh, but anything that can create a crack in the seed coat works sometimes i have used a small utility knife file is probably safer to use so what i do is i look at the seed and if it's really small then I'll use sandpaper and I just lay the seed on the sandpaper and kind of rub them around a little bit. If it's larger seed that I can physically hold, then the file is much easier to use. And what we want to do is we really just want a small crack here. We don't have to remove all the seed coat. We, we just want a small area that's thin enough for the water to get in. Really on, on larger seed, we'll, we'll score that until we can see through the seed coat and actually see the, the white part of the seed underneath. When you do this, it is important that you don't harm the embryo. The embryo is the part that's going to form the leaves and roots. And if we damage that, then it just won't grow right. Most of the seed is just extra carbohydrates. And we can cut into that and we really won't affect the way it grows. So how do you know where the embryo is? Well, on some seed, that's pretty simple. Uh, this one at the top here that's kind of black, you'll see this, this scar here. And if a seed has a scar, that usually tells you where it was attached to the mother plant. That's the area you'll find the embryo. So we want to stay away from that. On a bean seed, it's fairly obvious. Uh, one side is quite round and smooth, and the other side has this little dimple, this little scar here. And that's where it was attached to the mother plant. On some other seeds, I mean, you really can't tell by looking at them. And so then what I do is score them in different parts each seed differently so i'll pick up a seed and do one edge and pick up a seed and try to do a different edge or a different side or something so if i damage the embryo on a couple i haven't damaged it on all of them here's a closer look at some other seeds so on the left here we have one that's really quite easy to identify it's a nice red seed with a black tip and then you see the scar mark at the bottom and so we'll stay away from that. The picture on the right shows a sunflower seed. The drawing shows the, the way this seed looks. So it has a fairly thick outer coat. And that's the part we remove if we're eating sunflower seeds. The top part, the pointed part, that's where the embryo is sitting. Now this seed's kind of funny because if you look at it, it almost looks like the bottom end has the scar. It, it does have a special funny growth there. But in fact, these seeds are attached by the pointy end. And if we have a look at the sunflower itself and some seeds that are still in there, you can see that the bigger end, the round end, is the one that's sticking out. And the pointy end is still inside the flower. And that's the part that's attached to the sunflower, to, to the mother plant. So we, we want to stay away from that sharp tip in this case. 
The next thing that is very useful is to do some sort of soaking. We're going to look at a couple ways to germinate seeds, and some of them automatically soak our seeds. But some seeds are kind of tough, and they really do better if we soak them overnight. And here's some examples sitting in some baggies, and this is quite an easy way to do it. You put your seed in, put some water in, and you let it sit for 24 hours or so. The seed will swell. It usually doubles in size. It gets plumper looking, and that means that the seed has absorbed that water, and that now germination process has started inside the seed. You don't have to do this with all seed. A lot of seed has a thin enough coat that if we just put it in moist soil, or if you use my baggy method, it will get enough moisture that way. So I usually don't do this, but there are seeds where the instructions specifically say, soak for 24 hours or 48 hours. And last week we even looked at one that said soak for a week. And in that case, I do go through and do a soak in water. Now you can use this baggy method or another way that I found very handy is I, I save some caps off liquor bottles and they're just the right size to put in a few seeds and some water and I just let it sit there and I might even pour that water off once or twice. Let them sit there for, you know, 24, 48 hours, something like that. This isn't real precise. And then I take them and put them in the baggy method or pot them up and that's enough to get them to soak up that water. The most important thing we have to do is stratification. And stratification means that we give it a warm, cold, warm, cold cycle. And these cycles can start warm and then go cold, or they can start cold and then go warm. Every seed's a little different, and that's why you really have to look these up. Many of the more difficult seeds to germinate like to get a cold treatment first and then a warm treatment. But it's important to understand what this cold warm means. The seed has to have absorbed the water. And this is a, a mistake I see lots of gardeners make. They take their dried seed, though it's still in the package that they bought it in, and they put it in the fridge for a couple days, and they say, I've stratified my seed. I've given it a cold treatment. That's simply not true. If the seed is dry, that cold period doesn't do anything to help you germinate the seed. Absorption of water has to come first. That starts the biochemistry. Now that we've started it, the plant is looking for that cold or warm treatment. So we have to have them absorb some water first, and then we go through these cycles. The other tricky part is how long should these cycles be? If you go to the Ontario Rock Garden Society webpage, almost all the cycles are sort of 60, 90 days. And we don't know if that's the best time period. Some of these I think will do just fine if they get a week cold, but we don't know. And people haven't taken the time to experiment. So if you don't know, just follow the instructions. And I usually give these seeds three months cold. And I figure by then they've had enough of a cold treatment and then I move them into the warm. If that doesn't work, so I've given them three months cold, then I give them three months warm, they should germinate, but they don't germinate, then they go back and get another three months cold. And I repeat that cycle over and over again until they do germinate. Sometimes when the seed is very dormant, particularly when it's older seed, it may take several of these cycles. The best way to do this is in a fridge. The fridge is about four degrees centigrade. That's your cold cycle. Your room temperature is your warm cycle and you're moving back and forth between those. There are a few seeds where the instructions say that they need to have cold warm cycles very quickly. And then the best thing to do is to put them outside in the winter time and let nature do it. Uh, right now, we've gone through a period of fairly warm winter temperatures, and now the temperature is dropping, and apparently this weekend is going to be really cold, and then a week from now, it's going to warm up again. That's the kind of cycling these seeds need, and the easiest way to do that is just do it outside. Let winter take care of it for you. If you have seed and you've tried to germinate it warm and nothing's happening, it's always a good idea to put them into the cold for two or three months and then bring them out and see what happens. And a lot of times they germinate. The other thing you have to be aware of 
is that many seeds germinate in the cold. Okay, you think you put them in the fridge and you don't have to worry about them because it's nothing going to happen there until they get warm. That's not true. Many seeds germinate in the fridge. And as soon as they germinate, you want to bring them out of the fridge so they can grow warm. Another treatment that is not popular but is one worth trying is this here. It's called GA3 hormone or gibberellic acid. Gibberellic acid is a natural plant hormone and it controls a lot of things in the plant and one of them is germination in the seed. We manufacture this as a chemical. We expose the seed to the chemical and that can cause the seed to germinate. Instead of waiting for the plant to make its own gibberellic acid, we're giving it to the plant and probably in higher doses than it normally gets and that speeds up the process. Now gibberellic acid, you can get this from Amazon and you can get it from a number of other online places. It's generally not available from most nurseries and it's not necessary for most plants. If you're new to this, you're going to find, you know, hundreds of plants you can germinate without this. As you get more specialized in your seed, you're going to find some that really do much, much better with GA3. And here's one example that I'm going to go through. This is a beautiful plant. It's a Podophyllum hexandrum. It's an Asian species. It is similar to our North American Mayflower. And if I take the seed and go through a normal process, and this includes warm cold cycles, it can take me two to three years before I see the first true leaf. And this assumes that I'm going to do the cycles along with the winter, right? So we, we put it outside, we give it a winter, then we give it a summer, then we give it another winter. So it can take two or three years, which is just way, way too long. On the other hand, if I take this seed and I treat it with the GA3, I can have it germinating and showing me the leaf in eight weeks. And I can do it warm. This particular plant's a little weird in that it makes a root come out and then it, it doesn't like making the first leaf. And I've had some seeds where the leaf is just sitting there ready to go and as soon as I drop some GA3 on it, within days the leaf opens up and is there. Now uh, this is what the little seedlings look like and this is the plant itself. So it makes these May apple type leaves, it flowers quite early in the year, and then it makes these huge seed pods. And if you want to collect these seed pods, you have to protect them. I'm not sure if it's chipmunks or squirrels, but something in the garden will come and eat these. And they hang on the plant for about three months, and nobody takes it until they get nice and red, and that's when you want them too. These will be ready for harvesting here. And what I do is I put that organza bag on them, and then the animals leave them alone. And if I don't, I'll uh, lose these seeds. This plant has been hybridized along with other species in the Podophyllum family, and you get a whole range of really interesting looking plants. None of these are hardy in zone five. A couple of them will be hardy in zone six, and the rest of them, they, they really like warmer temperatures. Another thing that a lot of people use is hydrogen peroxide. And I'm gonna spend a bit of time on this. To be honest with you, I don't know how important hydrogen peroxide is. There are a few seeds where they recommend exposure to hydrogen peroxide. One that's all over the internet is your cannabis seed, right? It speeds up germination. Well, if you've ever tried cannabis seeds, these are really easy to germinate. So the first time I did it, the instruction said, soak them overnight and then plant them up. Okay, so I put them in some water overnight. By next morning, they were already germinating. So the last few times I germinated these, I just put them in some water, uh, you know, about half the, the thickness of the seeds. And within a day, these guys are germinating. They're so easy to germinate. I don't know why people need hydrogen peroxide to speed up this process. So here's a little diagram I found in a study that compared water with 1% peroxide, 3%, 5%, and 10%. After one day, well, the 1% peroxide had 80% germination. Plain water only had, you know, 45%. But by day two, they were equal. What the peroxide does here is it speeds it up by 12 hours. Well, 12 hours isn't really that important, so I don't know why anyone would bother with this. The other thing that's interesting is that if you look at 10% and 5%, 
uh, even the 3% here, it actually slows down the process. And it turns out that too much peroxide for too long of a soak can actually kill your seeds. So peroxide is one of those things you have to be a little careful of. And most of the instructions I've seen say soak them for an hour or two and use something like a 3% solution and then get them out of that. To be honest with you, I wouldn't use peroxide at all unless you've done some testing. If you really can't germinate something and you want to try it, great. But it can kill your seeds. Here's another study that was done. Uh, th this is Arabidopsis, which is a classical little weed that scientists use for all kinds of things. We know more about this plant than any other plant on the planet. And here's your control. So that's, you know, no treatment, no peroxide, and they're growing normally. They have a nice root system. As you go to the right, you get more and more peroxide. And what you see is that they don't develop proper roots. This plant loses its ability to know where gravity is. So the root doesn't actually grow down anymore. It starts growing sideways. And because of that, it's not growing as well. Basically, it screws up the seedling. So you have to be very careful about your peroxide. There are a lot of other suggestions online, and over the years, I've tried a number of these. This is one we went through a couple years ago. This is a pepper seed. This person did a really nice experiment. See, one of the problems that gardeners do is they try one thing, and it works. And so then they tell everybody, you have to do this. If you're going to do this kind of work, do a control. Every test you do should have some of the seeds in tap water and then compare it to other things. So in this case, some people think that chamomile tea will speed up germination. Other people think it has to be black tea. And this person decided to also use distilled water. And the reason they're using pepper seed here is that A, it's relatively available, but B, pepper seed is the slowest vegetable to germinate. And I'm told that hot peppers are even slower to germinate than sweet peppers. Although I haven't actually been able to verify that. Peppers, if it's cooler, can certainly take two to three weeks to germinate. Keep them warmer, they germinate faster. So we have a little experiment. We've got replications. So lots of containers, a few seeds in each one. Tried these various things. And I've repeated this experiment myself with a couple of different types of tea. And it makes absolutely no difference whatsoever. Although you'll find lots of posts on the internet saying that teas will speed up germination. The test is only with peppers. So maybe there's some other seed out there where black tea works, but probably not. Here are a few other things that can be used to overcome dormancy. Acids, uh, fire, and smoke. Now all three of these do work. So the acids tend to dissolve the outer coat a bit. And I think that's probably their main contribution. I would stay away from those because the acids that are recommended are fairly harmful. If you get in your eye and so on, you can blind yourself. So as amateurs, stay away from acids. Uh, smoke and fire are interesting. So some of our North American native pines have to undergo fire treatment. They need the heat, very high heat, to germinate the seeds. There's a lot of plants in uh, Australia for some reason that germinate much better if they're exposed to smoke. Now, I haven't really come across any North American seeds that need smoke. So these things will work. They may be needed for special seed. In general, you can ignore these though. Well, let's look at some germination methods. So we've gone through the pretreatment and we're ready to germinate these things. And I'm gonna look at three different techniques in pots, which is a standard way of doing this. We're gonna look at winter sowing. And then we're going to look at the paper towel baggy method. In pots, it's a process people feel comfortable with. You basically take a pot, put some soil in it, put your seed in it, and you wait for germination. I mean, that works quite well. Where this system doesn't work very well is when you need to do temperature cycles. So if you've got 50 seeds, you, it means you have at least 50 pots. You know, now you need to find a place to put these in the fridge so they stay cold. Cycling these things are a problem if they're grown in pots. So that's the one downside. The other thing that I think is really important is you can't see the germination process. And you might think, well, okay, I don't care. I've seen the seeds germinate before. I don't need to see it with every seed. But here's the problem you have. You have some seeds 
you plant them, they're inside the soil, they're covered with soil, you can't see the seeds. And now you wait. Week goes by, month goes by, two months go by. What happened? You, you don't know why they didn't germinate. It's possible that all the seed germinated and then died for some reason. Maybe all, they all got a fungus infection. Maybe they never germinated. You don't know that. And that's one of the disadvantages with this method. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, you're kind of at a loss as to why it didn't work. For this, we don't use real soil. We want a soilless mix. The most common soilless mix is a peat-based mix. And I tend to use ProMix, but any kind of mix like this works. Now, this particular bag says right on it, it's a premium organic seed starting mix. Okay, well, the organic word in there is kind of meaningless. I don't know how this can be organic. You don't need a seed starting mix. This bag is no different than their regular Pro Max. Any material that's designed for house plants works just fine. You don't have to go out and get a seedling mix. There's various containers you can use. So we'll start here with the egg one. And I see this on the internet all the time. This is a really dumb idea. I mean, if you want to play around with some kids and have some fun with it, that's great as an educational tool. To germinate seeds is kind of useless because as soon as you see any kind of leaves coming up, the root system is too big for these eggshells. And unless you put a hole in the bottom or there's a crack in the bottom, it, the water won't run out so this, they get too wet. Some people use egg cartons. That's just as dumb of an idea. The one on the top right is a commercial product. This is a Jiffy Pot and you buy them as small little discs, you soak them in water and they expand up. The big selling feature of these are that they degrade in the soil. So you start your seedlings and you don't have to take them out of this. You just plant the whole thing in the garden. Well, I have news for you. This doesn't degrade uh, anytime soon. It will be there next year and then maybe the year after. If you use these, which I don't recommend, you have to take that netting off. It's not biodegradable. The size of these is too small for most seedlings. At the bottom, we have a very traditional way of doing it, these six packs. And I don't really like these either. The problem is they outgrow these too quickly. So if it's a larger growing plant, in no time at all, you have to take them out of here and put them into a larger pot. So you might as well start in a larger pot. And what I like is regular pots. Now mine aren't quite as fancy as these, but just a regular plastic pot. Now there's another myth floating around out there, and that says that plants do better if you pot them up. So you start them in a small container, and then you move them up a little bit, and then you move them up a little bit as they grow. And that's a complete myth. In fact, you can put them in a big pot right away, and they grow just as well. You don't have to pot them up. What you do have to watch is the watering. So if you put seedlings into a large pot, you can overwater them a little easier than if they're in a small pot. And so if you're one of those people who water all the time, there is an advantage in starting small and moving up. But from the plant's perspective, it does just as well going right into a large pot. I tend to grow things this way. So I use standard plastic pots. I reuse them over and over again. So these things last me a good 10 years. That's good use of plastic in my opinion. I also tend to put lots of seeds into one pot, particularly if they're smaller seeds. Then as they grow, I move them from this pot into their own pot. But I like having small things start this way. This, this by the way, are streptocarpus, which are sort of related to the African violets. This is my new hobby, and these are fantastic plants. They're indoor plants, they're not garden plants in zone five. The seed is extremely small. The very smallest green little tips you see here are seedlings that have probably been up for about two weeks already. They're that small, but this works great, particularly for your smaller perennial. When you plant seed, you typically plant them at twice the depth of the seed. So you look at the thickness of the seed and, and double that. That's how deep you plant them. A uh, larger seed can go deeper. Very fine seed just gets sprinkled on top of the soil. It doesn't get covered. Put it on top of the soil, give the, the pot a little tap on the side and that will settle the seed enough. If you're worried about them drying out, you can put them in a plastic bag until they germinate, but usually you don't have to do. Another system that works really well and we still have time to do that this year in zone five, and that's winter sowing. 
The big advantage here is that you don't have to have any indoor space. You don't have to have indoor lights. It's the easiest method out of all three of these, and it produces really tough, tough plants. This may not be the best choice for plants that like to be warm all the time. So things that can't take frost could be a problem here. But to be honest, last year I tried tomatoes outside with winter sowing and they're warm growing plants. They can't take frost and they actually did quite well with winter sowing. It's a simple process. You take some sort of a container, cut the top off, you put some holes in the bottom, the container should be either clear or white. You put some soil in, and quite honestly, the, the worse the soil, the better it is. If you can get garden soil with some clay content, it actually stays moist longer and works better. But you can use any kind of pro mix type mix as well. Put the soil in, put your seeds in, cover it up, and put it outside. And that's it. You just leave it outside. You let nature do everything. So outside is going to get some warm days. It's going to get some cold days. It gets temperature cycling. It gets this natural cool period and then it'll start warming up and that germinates a lot of seeds. And it's a really simple method. Now some people go a little overboard and they have quite a few of these things going. That's what it looks like in winter. If you seal these up, uh, you water them once, seal them up, you can pretty much leave them till spring. Now the spring's coming, it's a little warmer as things grow, we can take the tops off. Once it warms up, you do have to watch these things a little bit because they can dry out. But what you find is that you create very tough little plants. So rather than having tall seedlings, you end up with really short ones, but they're really tough and they're actually better seedlings than you can grow inside. If you have a lot of them, you, you can do it this way. It's kind of a modified winter sowing. So I do this in a, a sunroom, but it's not heated. So in the wintertime, it gets quite cold in here. And I use these tubs. I just get these pots, put soil in, put my seed in, and I put them inside one of these tubs. And then I just wait till they germinate. The system I've used the most is the baggy method. It has advantages over the other two methods, particularly for mid-size and larger seeds. It requires very little space. Some years I was doing two or 300 different seeds. Well, you can imagine how many pots that would create. And yet I can do that in a very small little box using the Maggie method. Pre-treatment is really easy. I can see the seed. I can move it into the fridge. I can take it out of the fridge. I can leave it on my desk. Uh, it's really easy to do the cycling. I don't have any wasted pots. So things that don't germinate, well, I just end up discarding the bag and I don't have all this wasted pots. I don't have wasted soil and so on. I only pot them up once they've germinated. The system looks something like this. You get yourself a paper towel, and I, I like the shop towels. They're a little thicker. You can get that at a Home Depot type store. Put in a piece of paper towel, put your seeds on top, moisten it, and then you turn the whole bag upside down so the paper towel is sitting on top of the seeds. But you flip it over to have a look at it. And so you look at these uh, every two or three days, or if they're taking longer, you just look at them once a week. And when they germinate, you pull them out of here and pot them up. Now, what I'm showing you in the picture here are seeds that have been left far too long. You should pot them up as soon as you see the radical coming out of the seed. Now, I've left this one longer just so that you can see them a little easier in the slide. But you want to catch these as soon as they come out. And in fact, what I tend to do is I'll look at the seeds. And if I see two out of 50 germinating, I know the other 48 are right behind and I just pot them all up. A slightly different method, you can use the paper towel or in some cases I actually prefer using peat moss in here. And it, it really depends on, on the type of seed it is. The problem with the peat moss is that you really can't see the seed very well. But I like peat moss for really large seed. So this seed is say an inch across, I'll do it with the peat moss. I also do peonies in here, and they're maybe a quarter inch in size. I do that in peat moss too. As the seeds get smaller, I like the paper towel method. And really, really tiny seed, you can still do the paper towel method, but I generally just put those in pots. They're just too hard to get off the paper towel and pot them up. 
If you want to know more about the whole method, I have a YouTube video on my channel called Garden Fundamentals called The Baggy Method for Seeds. And that'll go through these steps in a little more detail. A friend of mine does the baggy method, but she prefers vermiculite over the paper towel. I find that the vermiculite is hard to get the moisture level just right. Now she doesn't have any problems, so this, this obviously works, but for me, I generally get it either too wet or too dry. The seed is a little harder to see in the vermiculite than it is on the paper towel, but this method works too. So what she does is she gets a fairly coarse vermiculite in here, puts the seeds in, adds a bit of moisture, and they just sit in the baggie until things germinate. Like with the other method, it's easy to move it in out of fridge in different conditions and so on. So this is what my seedlings look like. I take each single seed and put it in a pot. If it's a larger plant, if it's smaller plants, then I'll take the whole bunch of seeds and put them into one pot. So now let's talk about starting these seeds indoors. I think it's really important you have a fan going 24 seven. It doesn't have to be quite this big of a fan, but you want air movement. If you have air movement, you're very unlikely to get fungal infection. Without air movement, you might get a fungus. The fact that the seedlings are wiggling a bit in the wind is actually good for them. It'll make them a little stronger. A lot of you will grow on window cells and this will work just fine. Try to give them as much light as possible. So that means a south or west facing window is preferred and as close to the window as possible. If the seedling has already germinated and made leaves, you can't just shove it in a sunny window, you'll burn it. But if you do that at the point where the root is just starting and you don't have leaves yet, put it as close to the window as you can. The more light you can give it, the better seedlings you will get. The other alternative is to use various kinds of lighting systems. And in the past we've used fluorescent lights and they work quite well. I think if I was buying lights today, I would do one of two things. I might use shop lights, and that's sort of what this is. You can go to a home hardware type store and get LED shop lights. They give you a fair amount of light. They use very little electricity. You do have to keep these lights very close to the seedlings because they don't give out a lot of light, but they will do a fairly good job. The other alternative is to use prop grow lights. And the picture on the left is one of the units you can get. The light intensity is much higher here. The wavelengths of light that you're getting are more tuned to plants. And the lights perform much better than shop lights. The downside is these aren't cheap. There's many of them available on Amazon. And the price keeps coming down. And the quality and the amount of light you get is higher and higher. You can now buy lights like this that give you the same intensity of light as sunlight. You know, these LEDs are becoming really efficient. There's also options like you see on the right here, you can buy it at Amazon and other stores. And there's sort of these stick lights. These are pretty much useless. Now, if you have one plant and you wanna light it up a little bit, that's fine. They don't give enough light to grow seedlings. Heating mats come up all the time and people think they need them. Well, I grew almost all my seeds without heating mats. If you do use a heating mat, you use it to germinate. You want to warm up those seeds. As soon as you get germination, you take them off the heating mat. So you germinate warm, grow cool. Your temperature, even in a basement of most homes, is just about right for growing seedlings. You don't need extra heat. But to be honest with you, you really don't need a heating mat. Peppers do germinate faster at a higher temperature. So if you have them at room temperature, they may take two to three weeks to germinate. You put them on a heating mat and get them warmer, you might knock five, seven days off that period. There are a few problems you have to overcome. The biggest one are leggy seedlings. So a leggy seedling is one that's just too tall. This can be caused by a couple things, but usually it's a lack of light. If you over fertilize these, that could cause it, but most people don't do that with their seedlings. So this is almost always due to not enough light. The plant is growing taller, trying to fight enough light, and it tries to get really close to those bulbs. So if you see this, use more light. When do you start fertilizing these things? 
Well, the first leaves that you see on most seedlings, and the ones in the picture included here, are not true leaves. These are cotyledon leaves. So these leaves developed inside the seed, and they came up and they turn green once they see the light, but they're not true leaves. And in fact, most seedlings look about the same. The next leaf that will come up between these two will look different, and that will be your first true leaf. The cotyledon leaves are getting all their energy from the seed. They don't need to be fertilized. Once you have true leaves, you should start fertilizing them. I use the same fertilizer that I use on all my plants. I don't do anything special with seedlings. In fact, to be honest with you, I use that same water even before they germinate because I don't want to have two different kinds of pails of water. So I make up a pail of water, I put some fertilizer in it, and I use it right from day one on these plants. But they really don't need fertilizer until they start making their first true leaf. I like growing them in these community pots. So I have a pot here with numerous seeds and I get numerous plants. And if I have really good germination, I have far too many plants in here. Now I'm growing for myself. If I have three or four of these plants, that's probably lots. Unless it's something special like my streptocarpus, because in the streptocarpus, they're highly hybridized and every one will look different. So there I want to keep every one. But for most species type of perennials and trees and so on, you don't need a whole bunch. When they get larger, they start uh, hogging the light and they stop growing. So you need to thin these and one of the best ways is just to cut them off with a pair of scissors. You don't really want to pull them out because that disturbs the soil around the other ones that are trying to grow. So I just come along with, with either my fingernails or a pair of scissors like this and cut out every third one or so and then I'll leave it for a couple weeks and then it starts looking a little thick again. I come and do it again. The biggest problem that we have with these things is something called damping off. And we talk about damping off as being a disease. It's actually the result of many different types of diseases. Most of them are fungal, but they can also be bacterial. But the symptoms are that the top part of the seedling looks pretty normal and the stem near the soil shrinks and gets very thin and soft and then the seedling falls over within a couple of days it's gone it's dead that's damping off and what's happened here is fungus has attacked the stem very close to the soil level it gets inside the plant and it's slowly spreading up the seedling and once it's in the plant your seedling's pretty much gone that fan will keep this away the only time i ever have problems is if i don't use a fan if I have a problem, the easiest solution is cinnamon. I'm not a big believer for using DIY solutions from the kitchen. In fact, if you read my blog post, you'll know that most of the advice of using things in the kitchen for plants is a waste of time. But cinnamon does work. It has been shown scientifically to be an antifungal agent. So if I see any damage at all, I just sprinkle cinnamon all over the soil and over the plants. It doesn't really matter. The fungus is gone within a day. Here's another problem that you can have, and this is one reason why I don't like trays like this. So a lot of people do this, and you know they'll plant a certain type of seed in row one and a different type of seed in row two and, and so on. The problem is these all germinate at different times and grow at different speeds. And so now we've got some really tiny ones that are just germinating and we have some other ones that are too large. It's very hard to manage these. That's why I like each species in their own pot as much as possible. Now you can overcome that by simply taking the larger ones out here and moving them. But even doing things like stratification here is a problem, right? Some of these might be warm growers, some are cool growers, and you've got them all mixed into the same pot. So how do we get them into the garden? So hardening off is a process where we get them used to outdoor conditions. And there's three conditions, sunlight, wind, and temperature. And particularly in the spring, right? Temperature is important. Inside the house, they have low light, no wind, and warm, cozy conditions. And now we want them outside in the spring. And in fact, the sooner we can get them outside, the better, because our lights inside just aren't really good. 
we got to get them used to all three conditions. And the easiest way to do this is you just put them on your north side of the house. You leave them out there for a couple hours. Two days later, you leave them out a little longer. You move them away from the house. So slowly over about a week period, you give them more light, more wind, and lower temperature. And a week later, they should be used to being outside. Now I've got them outside, what do I do with these things? Well, if you've grown vegetables, you're probably used to these things growing pretty quickly, right? By the time you're ready to go outside, you've got a tomato plant that's a foot tall. Most of the perennials, especially trees and shrubs, they don't grow as fast as vegetables. These pots here, these could be almost a year old, and they're still very tiny. Now I grew a lot of rock garden plants, and they stay small. Uh, these ones down here that look like grass, those are probably bulbs. They don't do much for a year or two. Uh, right at the top of this row, these are columbines of some sort, and they don't grow very fast either. So it may take a couple years before you actually have a decent sized plant. So what I do is I take my pots, and rather than put them on a bench outside, I sink them in the soil. And the reason is that I have to water a whole lot less. If these pots are sitting on a bench, you know, once it gets hot, you pretty much have to water them daily or at least every second day. Sitting in the ground like this, eh, you water them once a week. Okay, that moisture from the soil soaks into the pot. The sun is not hitting the side of the pot, so the soil stays cooler. That's better for the roots, and they're pretty happy this way. And quite honestly, I keep them in the ground until they're big enough to go into the garden. So here's one of my nursery beds, and you see smaller ones near the front of the slide. And then as you move down here, these are one-gallon pots, and the plants are a little bigger. And some back here are already a foot, foot and a half tall. And I like to grow them a little larger before they go out into my garden. As they grow, I repot them, I divide them, depending on their size. Here's an example of some pots that are getting pretty big, maybe some of them are a little too big, they'll come out, they'll be put into the garden or they'll go into bigger pots. If they're not large enough by winter, well, they just stay in the ground and I don't cover them or anything. I want to know whether these plants are going to survive my zone five winters. So I just leave them out there, let the snow come, let nature do her thing. Some of these will be dead by spring, but then I know that they're not going to grow in my garden anyways. The ones that are hardy will come back in the spring. So there's a couple other things to think about. If I take these pots from inside the house and I want to eventually get them into the garden, you think about the soil. So inside we've started with peat moss. That's not really soil. The garden, you know, in my case, is a fairly heavy clay soil. But almost everybody's garden soil is quite different than the peat moss they start them in. And so I like to do a gradual progression. I don't want to take them from the soil that I started them in and put them right into my garden soil. So anytime I'm repotting them once they're outside, I mix the soil. So I'll take some peat moss and I'll take some of my garden soil, mix it together. Now I have a soil that's kind of halfway between them. And then I'll let the seedling grow in that soil, even though they're still in a pot. My ideal situation is that by the time they're large enough to go into my garden, they're in 100% garden soil and they're used to that soil. And along the way, I'm sort of selecting for plants that will grow in my soil. If this is a plant that needs really sandy soil, well, maybe it doesn't make it. It dies along the way. But at least I'm not putting it into a garden in the soil that it can't handle. The other thing you do have to consider is how much sun and shade these plants need. When they go outside, I make sure I know whether these are shady plants or sunny plants, and I put them in appropriate locations. Some of my nursery beds are completely open. They get sun all day long, and that's for the plants that need that kind of sun. For my shady plants, I put them in a slightly different location. So sometimes I put them in a shady area, or in fact, what I've done is I've created a little shade greenhouse where I have a structure built that's two feet tall and it kind of covers the plants. They're still sitting in the ground, but now they have this shade over top and you know it might be 40% shade. So here I can grow my shade loving plants until they're large enough to go into the garden.
In this video, I've discussed a number of different techniques, and in most cases, I've gone over them fairly quickly. I've developed a specific video for every step in the germination process. So if you'd like to see these things in more detail, have a look at my library of seed starting videos, and you get to it right here. Have fun in the garden.